Hello, lovely people. I remember a saying when I was young, um, God gave us our families. Thank God we can choose our friends. And I, I actually think I bought my sister a birthday card with that on one year. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's kind of very true. God did give us our family. And thank God we can choose our friends. But family is something that is extremely important to all of us. And we take on all the beliefs, a lot of the limiting beliefs and the beliefs that our family have around us. And I've spoken about this quite a few times on this podcast, talking about EFT. Uh, but today I'm going to cover something a little bit different to EFE, EFT, which is my absolute favorite modality in my healing journey, which is something called matrix re-imprinting. And uh, there is one man that I just had to bring up for this podcast, uh, and that is Ted Wilmot. And he's advanced to EFT practitioner and an EFT matrix re-imprint master trainer. And, uh, and we're going to talk about how your ancestors affect your life and your life patterns. Uh, and in the second half of this podcast, which will only be on Rumble, we're going to talk about what the last three years and, you know, the stress uh, and fear that we've been put under, how that could affect our ancestor, our you know, we are ancestors, our future generations health and what we can do to change it. And that's the most important thing. The fact that we are able to change this paradigm. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Ted Wilmot. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, Ted. It's a real pleasure. Uh, thank you for asking me, Philly. And uh, I'm always delighted to share uh, the great modalities of EFT and particularly metric three and printing because they are great resources and tools to make us conscious of our incredible power. Absolutely. And uh, you know, for those people in the UK at the moment, there's something called I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here on TV. And I'd say, please don't watch it because we have a member of parliament in there that really shouldn't be there. <laughs> um, but, but if you have seen any little clips, he's been in the jungle with somebody called Boy George and Boy George has been tapping and all yes. of a sudden people are beginning to talk about tapping uh, mm. and it is a fantastic modality so before we um before we continue with our interview Ted could you just tell me uh, and the audience a little bit about you and how you got introduced to EFT yeah, uh, it's about 15 years ago. I was still working in the muggle world and Carl Dawson <laughs> uh, had been and continues to be my very best friend. Um, he's one of Gary Craig's founding EFT world masters and the divisor and um, author of the uh, Matrix Reimprinting, which is just phenomenal. Uh, but I was in the very cynical world running a, a chain of restaurants, nightclubs and bars uh, in London and uh, in a very tough angry world and the same Carl called me Mr. Cynical um, because that's how that business makes you <laughs> but uh, you know um, you talked earlier about family and just to say uh, the biological family as you call it the family God gave us yes we absolutely have our biological family but we, I say we also have our logicals and friends become logical family and Carl is one of my logical family without a doubt so he kept going on about this EFT that he had discovered, this tapping stuff. And Carl uh, worked with me way back in 1990. We, we met and he worked with me uh, when he was still in the hospitality industry as well. And at, late at night, we sometimes uh, at the end of the bar, when we finished work, would put the world to rights and he would share his spiritual journey and his aspirations. And I really got a lot of what he said. I understood it. Um, with a very cynical open mind, <laughs> <laughs> as you but, do, uh, yeah, but in the muggle uh, world, anyway, I love that. <laughs> yeah, he talked to me about this EFT, this tapping, and he sent me uh, some of Gary Craig's old CD ROMs because I was nearly 50 then and I still couldn't swim. I had a, an irrational fear of the water, a real phobia almost. Uh, his children, who were four and five years old, we would go on holidays together every year. We'd have a lovely villa and a pool, private pool. I would get in and if I 
with my feet bobbed an inch of the bottom of the pool, I went into complete panic. Wow. I mean, I would scream. Yeah. Uh, it was real fear. And it made, left me feeling completely debilitated in that I felt such a failure, such worthless and such a, you know, a scaredy cat. And the kids were laughing, you know, trying yeah, to teach no, me. And absolutely. They were, they're diving into the deep end of the pool. So um, I one afternoon in the office, I locked the door so that my PA wouldn't see me doing this tapping <laughs> stuff. And I put, put it on and I tapped along with it. He said to Carlson, you just put it on and just do what's on there. Just tap along. And focus on that fear, wherever you feel it in the body, if it's swimming. And, you know, I then got a memory that came up of being eight years old or seven, seven and a half, eight, going to the local beach, which was a mile from where I was brought up in Ireland, with all the mum and lots of my brothers and sisters. And she had warned me not to go to this pool. It was called the Blue Pool. It was a deep rock pool where the older boys would dive in and swim and stuff. My elder brothers were there. And I thought, oh, I'd love to go over there and be with them instead of paddling with my sisters. So I got over to the deep pool and thought, oh, you just, you just get in and move your arms and legs. That's swimming. So I jumped in and, of course, somebody pulled me out when I was bobbing down for the third time wow. and panicking. Now, that wasn't, that was trauma. There was my trauma. And I never recognised that as a trauma. No, it's a massive trauma. That. I didn't connect that with not being able to swim when I was 50. You don't. You forget about these things. Move on. Box mm, them up. Yes. Yeah. But then there was a secondary trauma that day because I was pleading with the guy who said, please don't tell my mum, please don't tell my mum, because she would have beaten the life out of me. Because my mum had nine, nine of us, a wonderful mother, an earth angel, but lived on complete hypervigilance to keep us all safe. And of course, what happens when you think something's going to happen to one of your kids, you're going to fear. When you're going to fear, anger comes and you smack or you shout or you tell off. You've seen many parents get a child who's running in front of a car and the first thing they do is smack the child or shake them or shout at them. Because the fear brings the anger. So I knew that she would completely explode on me and how dare you disobey me and I warned you not to. And I knew what I would happen. So I lived in the fear. She never found out. But I lived in the fear that she might. So that was always connected to swimming and water. And also and course, there must have been a, a lot of guilt there as well. You felt guilty because you let her down, you disobeyed I've been a bad us. boy, I disobeyed, absolutely. And I was always trying to be a good boy. But, um, well, as my mother used to say, we knew better. Somebody asked her one day, why are your children all so well behaved and nice mannered and they never speak back? And my mother would say, oh, they know better. Oh. So she kept control. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so you were so, sitting in your office with the door locked, happened. so your VA, your PA couldn't come in. Yeah, and and, and all this trauma came up. Yeah, and I just tapped, and I thought, oh gosh, I remember that now. And you know what? Very simply, I tapped, and then I could free myself thinking about getting into the swimming pool at the gym upstairs where I was a member. I used to go in the morning and get some exercise before I came into the office at seven o'clock and they had a beautiful swimming pool that I never went to. I thought, I think I could give this a go now. I went upstairs the next day before I went to work and I got myself up the pool in a strange sort of stroke, stop, start, stop, start, but I got up without too much panic. Wow. And so I immediately booked six... 40 minute swimming lessons in my lunch breaks and I went every day and by the end of the six days I could do the I learned how to do the, the technical parts of the stroke the front how crawl amazing. and amazing and I love swimming I go twice a week now and swim and at the local gym and I just love it I wouldn't say I'm going to be an open sea swimmer ever but I don't want to be <laughs> I don't need to be there's somebody said to me when I share this story in the training and I tell people this to say Somebody said one day, so what, you can swim now? What's so big about that? And I say, it's not about being able to swim. It's about being emotionally free of the fear and the trauma and the Absolutely. effects that's had on everything. And that's where my journey started. And I opened up and I became, I went and did EFT. I gave up my career of 38 years in hospitality and became a full-time EFT practitioner and trainer and then matrix re-imprinting. I mentor lots and lots of practitioners. Now that's become a bit of my 40 recently. Lots of practitioners come now to have some webinars where I talk about fields and changing the fields, past, present and future, ancestral, surrogate, whatever topic. I 
because I've seen well in excess of 12,000 sessions I've done with people over the years in the wow. last 15 years. So, uh, you know, I have a lot of experience that I really want to share and help to, people to work much more resourcefully for their, themselves and their clients. Uh, that is fantastic to hear. And, I, you, you know, <laughs> you're very well known in our circles. Uh, but you mentioned the field there and um, our audience might not know what the field is yet. I haven't covered it yet on the podcast. I'm sure there's okay. a lot of enlightened people that do know. Uh, but can you just tell us what the field is? Well, the field is just like like a field. It's information pure information, the past, the present, the future. Um, and, and we call it the matrix in matrix reimprinting. Some people call it the field. Some people call it the mind of God. Basically, uh, I think Greg Braden said it very well. It's, it's the universe and the container that it's held in. It's everything. But it's, and there are fields within the fields. It's fields, for me, it's about information, energy and information. And we tune into these fields, we read them subconsciously. Our receptors on our cells, as Bruce Lipton says, constantly reads the environment. That's what it is. The field is the environment that we're in. And there's a field of the body, a field of your eye, and a field of you and your family, and a field of your family in your country, in your culture, and in the world, and so on and so on. But it's all one huge mine of information, all life. Is there. Absolutely. I think Dr. Bruce Lipton describes it very well by calling us a computer um, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's the blueprint. And yes. we there's been quite a lot of research over the last kind of 10 years about, you know, if you live with somebody that's overweight or, you know, your your friend is overweight, then there's a good chance. I think it's a 40 or 60 percent chance that you will become overweight because we 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 just take on each other's energy all around us don't we yeah and i i work in that area greatly and a lot of that is done out of fear of being separate and different from those in our family field our friendship field yeah and that's a lot of that i as a child was underweight uh, my mother got me a tonic to make me eat i was a bit anemic at 10 11 years old at 12 i started being on weight and i've struggled to keep my weight in check ever since been overweight all of my adult life. But I can remember as a eight-year-old child, all of my mother's family and father's family were overweight people, all of them. Some of my father's sisters and brothers in morbidly obese. And I didn't look like either dad's family or a bit like some of mum's family, but I can remember my aunts discussing me as they do in front of children. We don't know who he's like. And there was various jokes made about the milkman, et cetera, which, you know, people do and think it's funny. Yeah. But I can remember, I can remember some of the saying, look at how skinny, skinny he is. And I remember one of my aunts saying, oh, don't you worry, you'll get fat like the rest of us. Wow. That's um, just put a huge limiting belief on you. <laughs> Absolutely. But also <clears throat> we can say, oh, yeah, I will be like the rest of you. I won't be different. I won't be the misfit. I won't be the separate one. That's a greater fear than being fat. Yeah. Fear of being alone, of being different, of not fitting in, of not belonging, not being a part of, being apart from. And that's the work that I do is this misperception of separateness. But I say the good thing about separateness, I call it a sit gloat. And this came to me when I was working with a client one day when I was really developing this work of separateness. And everybody who came to me were, was running this primal fear. And I said to this person who was really struggling to feel a part of anything, I said, but separation is a sit gloat. S-I-T-G-L-O-A-T. -I, -I, I thought, where did that come from? And she said, what does that mean? And I said, oh, simple. I said, separation is the greatest lie of all time. We are not separate, nor can we ever be. We are part of all that is. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we're going to come to that later on. Uh, for our Rumble listeners, <laughs> viewers later on, because uh, we've obviously just had three years of uh, tremendous um, separation put a upon us. And, Absolutely. Um, yeah, but it's we'll come as, to... It's used, as a, it's used as a weapon all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we will come to that later. Um, <laughs> definitely. So I'm going to 
you've explained the field. Yes. Um, and tapping is basically um, acupuncture without the needles, and you're tapping mm -hmm. on the ends of energy meridians and you're yeah. shifting your energy around is there anything you'd like to add to that ted have i made it too simplistic no no absolutely the simple the better i say I, i'm simple i like simple things and that's why this works and that's why gary craig simplified it in his protocol but i say it simply keeps you awake it's saying wake up keep awake, keep conscious it keeps you out of the fear where you are unconscious and it, keep, it brings you back into consciousness where you can work out a solution. You're focused on the problem, not trying to close it down. So it keeps you awake and you know what to do. And it's the best tool I know for releasing trauma from the energy field of your body, your mind. So it releases that trauma. And then your conscious mind, which shuts down immediately in flight, fright and fear, wakes up again. And that's where you're creative. That's where you find solution. That's where you are aware of reality. Because when you're in the old unconscious mind, you're simply in flight or fright. And that's all you can do is run or fight. Or freeze. So, <laughs> or freeze. Or, or freeze. freeze. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, um, so it's a very elegant tool. Um, and it really just clears the body of trauma. But for me, it keeps you in your conscious creative mind where you work out solutions and survival. Yeah, that's absolutely brilliantly put. And it's yeah. worth remembering that 95% of the mind is the subconscious mind. And yes. we don't we don't have any recollection of the subconscious mind um, at all. And so if you're stuck into that and you're stuck into the patterns and you know what what Carl calls the wall, um, yes. you know. Um, so do you would you like to explain to us the wall? Yeah, well, that's the bit where you you're not even aware of the pattern. I, I think um, the the biggest cause of suffering and human illness, disease, as Bruce Lipton talks about, are these um, wrong, harmful, negative beliefs. Bruce said, you know, ninety five percent of all disease is caused by stress. And 100% of stress is caused by negative or limiting wrong beliefs. But most of these are so subconscious, we're not even aware of them. But when you tap and keep in the consciousness and recall a memory and look at it and visit it and follow the energy of it, it will take you to where that subconscious problem is and you then have that awareness of it. So you can then change the tape, as Bruce said, by tapping and metrics re-imprinting and changing the limiting beliefs. So that really is the wall, is that limiting belief that keeps running and running and running and running, like a learned tape in the subconscious mind. And until you press the record button and change it, you will constantly hit that wall. Mm -hmm. And and that wall, its foundations are laid by you know your parents, your teachers, your family, um, your religion. It's it's everything that you grow up. And with. your ancestors and the generations and all who went before you. And I was going to come to that, but before we come to that, before we come to that, Ted, um, let's just um, tell our audience a little bit more about what matrix re-imprint is because there must be a lot of people here today who are kind of going what the fuck are they talking about and i know yeah. that when i did yeah. my first course i was just like you know first of all i i trained in eft and i just thought this looks as mad as shit and it can't do anything and then when i did matrix re-imprint um it, well i think the first time that I went into the matrix and I'll let you explain in a moment what the matrix is. The first time I went in, I actually had an ab reaction. I, mm. I came across so much trauma that I, I, I just hadn't crossed my mind that could be in my field. So mm -hmm. can you, can you put it really simply what you do? You so use the tapping and then what happens through the tapping? Yeah. Well, as uh, Carl said, we start to tap and tune in. As you tap, you're tuning in to old memories and things come up when people start to tap because you're staying in the conscious mind and you're becoming aware of the subconscious programming. But as we follow the energy, Carl uses a lot of, in metrics reimprinting, we use follow the energy of that, the feeling of that in the body. And it will bring up old memories that were suppressed or long forgotten. 
home because you're in that energy field of that. Up it comes. But the good thing is uh, with matrix reimprinting, we can keep you dissociated where you can tap on that part of you that's holding the trauma of the past. Because, you know, imprint and reimprinting people get a bit mixed up. What does that mean? Well, imprint things are imprinted upon us. Like, as you say, from your family, your culture, your beliefs, the news, things you observe and hear. People are imprinting beliefs and opinions and information on you. And then you make decisions and beliefs about that. So but when we're talking about re-imprinting, we're going to say, what is that old imprint? What's the old belief that's imprinted in you? I'm not good enough. I am stupid. I will never be. I always have to. Whatever that will be, it begins with I. I say it's the power of I am. These negative limiting beliefs that we imprint then ourselves become very powerful. I am stupid. You know, a child that's constantly told, you're stupid, you're not as clever as your brother, you're not as clever as your sister. They may not even use the word stupid when they're telling you, but oh, you, you know, they, they can't really do that. They're not, not very bright, not, not academic. Then the child makes the belief, particularly before six-year-old, that I am stupid. That's imprinted then. That's your go-to. That's your complete default setting. I'm highly yes. dyslexic. And so there was just a table that I was sat on at school, um, mm. which was kind of for the thickos. And there was nothing thick about me. I just yeah. have a different wiring yeah. of my brain. Yeah. But you get just, that limiting it's, belief. It's not, the fact that you were set, it's not the fact that you were set at that table and you were different that traumatized you. Know? It's what you made that mean as you sat at that table as a six-year-old or a five-year-old or a seven-year-old. What did you make that mean? I'm a thicko. I'm at the thickles table because that's the information you got. So, but it's people can say all day long, you're a thicko, you're a thicko. But if you don't believe it, if it's not your belief, it doesn't touch you. You won't even hear them say it. But it's the power of I am when you turn that information into, oh, oh that's what that means. That means I'm a thicko. That means I'm stupid. That means I'll never get on. That means everybody will laugh at me. But hundreds of beliefs can be formed in that. Mm -hmm. But I always say it's the power of I am, not the power of you are. And that's what we use with matrix to go back. Now, as an adult, you understand dyslexia and you understand that far from being a thick of you, you're a highly intelligent person and very resourceful who's worked out ways to get around the way uh, that conventional education is taught and how you receive it. Absolutely. You've got a way of getting around that system that they didn't adapt for millennia. Absolutely. And so... So therefore, you are now coming back with new information and you're re-imprinting the new belief. Ah, I am fickle, not true. I am incredibly adaptive and creative. Absolutely true. Sorry to interrupt this episode, but if you're enjoying this podcast and you'd like to find out more about my work, please come and join me on my webpage, phillyjlade.com, where I can give you all the up to date information of what I'm doing. You will get a free exclusive walking into your future meditation. I'm a shit hot manifest to me. You can find out how to buy my book, The Natural Wellness Journal, a lay person's guide to your natural health systems, your very own NHS. We all have them. Let's use them. I look forward to seeing you there. And introducing you to my new Rumble channel. Yes, I'm going to Rumble where we will have freedom of speech and my guests can talk about anything they want to. Thank you. I'll see you there. Can you just explain to our audience the difference between your ancestral trauma and your past life trauma? For me, they're very much one and the same. I think past life, because as I say, when you read the field, maybe of ancestors or a time that's gone by, um, you may not know they're directly your ancestors that you're you're reading the field of. For some people, it's so vivid, it really feels I was there. I lived that life. It's so strong deja vu. Deja vu is incredibly powerful. I had it one morning, we were driving through Normandy in France, and we used to have holidays years ago, driving up through Normandy and Brittany along this coast. I love it along those beaches and right along the coast. I've driven a number of times. And one morning after breakfast, I was sort of, you know, daydreaming in the car in that theta state. And, oh, what's this place called? I said, we've been here before. No, no, 
I was told by my partner, we've never been this far up the coast before. I said, I've been here before. He said, no, no, we haven't. I, said, but I almost knew what was coming around the next corner. It was so familiar. And it lasted for a couple of minutes. And as we were leaving this little French town, there was a post a signpost that said, Twinned with Clona Kilty County Cork. I recognised it from Irish towns I've been in. Same, same, but different. But you see, I was uh, convinced I'd been there and lived that yeah. before. So for me, that's it. You're reading a field that's so similar. You feel that you actually were there. Now, you now were there. We know that's not possible because you're physically just here now this lifetime. But uh, who knows? The mind is so powerful. And it's so strong sometimes the connection that you make and reading those fields and that those fields of information of ancestral or might not might not even be your biological family. So you could that's why we're very close to some with some logical. So we may have similar receptors and we read say, same fields, have same similar beliefs and similar understandings of life. And I want to bring you on to the fact that you might not be biological. Um, you know, if if people are adopted listening to this podcast. Huh. Um, I, don't, I covered this in my webinar as well. I'm glad I'd, you brought I'd, that up. Yeah, I'd like to talk about that. I've worked with a number of people and I did some demonstrations, in fact, matrix live demos with people who were adopted in the ancestral field. And people said, why did you pick somebody, you know, who was adopted to look at it? Because I said, that is their family. It's their logical, it's their adopted, it's family is family. And uh, the very interesting thing is that I, I know someone who was adopted and they discovered their family late in life in their 50s. And whenever she came to a family event, I was there too. Uh, she met some cousins. Now, her mother gave her up for adoption when she was born. Her mother was only 16 and the family said, no, you must give this child up. That's the way it was then. Not much choice. But when she met these cousins, these were cousins from um, her birth mother's husband. So he was their uncle. Okay. So okay. her mother gave, gave her up, gave her, uh, but she married another man, not the father. So, yeah. So then at this party, at this event, family get together. Her birth mother's husband. Yeah. Yeah. Who's absolutely no genetic relation. His two nieces turned up. So that, you know, had had he been this girl's father, it would have been her direct cousins. Yeah? Yep. But she was no not. relation. But, but she's the double of these two sisters, these two cousins. Gosh. But, um, so, but there, is, yeah. there is no biological connection. But you see, still reading the field of the family of her mother and the life that's on. Yeah. And she's way more like the mother's husband's nieces than she is like her mother. It's quite strange. I have um, I have two daughters and then um, I have a, a, a beautiful young woman who is, is kind of... Um, She's not an adopted daughter in any shape or form. She has a brilliant mother, but she kind of is part of our family too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she looks so like my two children. It's it's just incredible. And I remember when my girls went to primary school and um, and I went along on the first day and somebody said, oh, how old's your eldest daughter? And I said, oh, she's eight. And they said, no, your eldest daughter. I okay, go, she's eight. And then I realized that they meant this other yes. woman who was 30. I go, oh, she, yeah. she's not my daughter. But because they spent so much time together as children, I don't know if mm -hmm. that is part yes. of it. Synchronization and being apart and conforming and even starting to look like, sound like, talk like, believe like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's entrainment. And we do that in groups all the time. That's why we feel the safety in groups, we become entrained. I mean, People that come into room, even their heartbeats will become synchronized. Uh, young women who get together in boarding schools, because their menstrual cycles will start to synchronize. Yep, absolutely. So that's and that's all about resolving the fear of being separate. Oh, I belong. I'm part of. We're the same, and that's imitation. That's why we flatter each other and be like each other, uh, because we want to be the same and we want to belong. 
even if we don't agree with some of the stuff in that group, we'll not speak against it because we want to belong. We're scared we'll be cast out if we don't. And that's what's being used against us a lot of the time. Yeah. Now I'm going to come on to that. So um, for, mm-hmm. for those of you lovely people that want to hop over to Rumble before you go, uh, we're just going to play you out the brilliant Ted Wilmot with... Um, the intro to the wellness awakening about our ancestors. Uh, Before we do that, Ted, where can people find you if they'd like to train with you or they want uh, a session with you? Where can people find you, Ted? Yeah, I offer lots of one-to-one sessions, mentoring for practitioners, um, you know, looking at different fields and techniques and resources. Uh, I also do training and you can find me at simply tedwilmont at gmail.com. Just drop me an email. I took down my website some time ago. Um, I didn't want to keep it up and do stuff. So people just find me. It's okay. <laughs> so tedwilmont at gmail.com. Yeah, people, that, you know, the world has a way of putting the right people into people's paths. You know, that's that's what happens. I just uh, say pe- people, people I'm meant to connect with, we will find each other. Yeah, yeah, spot on. So um, I'm just going to play the meditation, which um, I hope you enjoy. And you can find this meditation over on my website. Uh, I do have a website, sorry, Ted, uh, phillyjlay.com. And uh, all the details of where you can find my work is there. So I'm going to play you out with that. And then for those of you lovely people that want to come and join Ted and I on Rumble, we'll be there very shortly. Thank you. Welcome to the wonderful world of meditation. With me, Philly J. Lay. We all have traumas in our lives. Big T's and little T's. Little T's are the small things that just annoy you. Forgetting something. Getting a parking ticket. Getting ghosted on Tinder. Hey, just me then. But they trigger you, putting negative energy into the body. Big T's are the big losses, the grief we encounter over our lives. Grief comes in many forms, not just death. It comes from being separated from loved ones for whatever reason, losing a job, a business, a home, a relationship, an education, a childhood, where the seeds of life are planted. A life that has been planted before our time, through the lives of those who have gone before us and their traumas. You have two parents. What trauma did they go through? Four grandparents. Your grandmother grew the egg that grew you. What trauma did she go through? So you already have taken on the traumas of two generations. You have eight great grandparents. What were their traumas? Sixteen great great grandparents. 32 great-great-great-great-grandparents, 64 great-great-great-great-great-grandparents, 2,048 great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents who all have sown seeds into your existence. But out of tiny acorns, great oaks grow and you have the amazing ability to be that great oak never let anyone tell you differently and even when a branch has broken off in the storm you still have the astonishing ability to continue to grow and flourish everyone breaks at some point in their lives It's where the light comes in. All those generations, 
all those branches that got broken along the way. But you can start that regrowth with you. Beautiful, wonderful, astonishing you. What is a life but a journey? A journey of self-discovery and releasing old traumas that do not serve you. You have shown up here today for yourself just by being here. And you are worth it. Beautiful. Wonderful. Astonishing you. Be kind to yourself. You deserve it. Deserve to be released from all the traumas that sit inside of your body. And walk forward on your new path of self-discovery and connect to the great universe of life. You don't meditate to get good at meditation, but to get good at life, to release the pain of the past, to connect to the energy vibrations of the universe. There is no right or wrong here. Map your own path. Listen to your body, listen to your gut, listen to your heart. They will tell you. The important thing is this. Not what you are, but what you can become. And remember, where you are now is not your final destination. If you would like to see more of this interview, please head over to my Rumble channel and join my locals community. We have never experienced such unbelievable censorship in the natural health community, and Rumble is one of the very few places left to speak freely about what has happened to our health over the last few years and debate if Western medicine has been hijacked. I will never ask any of my guests to be censored, so I will be putting the full uncut video versions of all podcasts up for free. All you have to do is create an account if you haven't done so already. The link is in the show notes and I would highly recommend that you come and join me. And you can sign up to my webpage for my newsletters and details of all my work, including my Telegram channel, which is also uncensored if you would like to learn even more. Thank you.